Welcome to Three Devs and a Maybe, the podcast series for beginner web developers and general web enthusiasts. Now, introducing your show hosts Michael Budd, Fraser Hart, Lewis Keynes, and Ed Mann. Hello and welcome to another episode of Three Devs and a Maybe. My name's Ed Mann and today we're very lucky to be joined by Jonathan Clean. How you doing, John? Doing well, thanks. Awesome. You emailed us a couple of weeks ago about a recent Plural site course that you released. And uh, it was all about high-performance PHP and performance-related stuff to with web applications. I had a look through like your talks and everything. I thought, this is really interesting stuff. So I thought it would be great to get you on. Just for the audience, I don't know if you may it's a little introduction about yourself. Yeah, absolutely. So I started my career at Wayfair. And I was part of the team there that rewrote their site from classic ASP to PHP. And at the time, the, the site was actually already receiving quite a bit of traffic um, on the order of sort of hundreds of millions of dollars a year of, of revenue. So performance was a key consideration with the rewrite. We had to make sure that when we launched, we had the performance on lockdown, had good monitoring in place, et cetera. So I spent about four years there. Then I transitioned to Etsy and actually joined the performance team at Etsy. Uh, and Etsy is a huge user of PHP as well. And they get substantially more traffic than Wayfair. So it was another challenge there. And now I run the engineering team at Attend, which is a small startup in Boston. Brilliant. And, and with the classic ASP stuff, just kind of going into that, um, bringing back those dark memories, I'm sure. Uh, you know, was, was it performance? Was it, were you trying to boost? Obviously, was it better performance you got out of PHP? Like was from the offset with the conversion with the idea to actually move to PHP, get better performance, use uh, up-to-date language? Yeah, so the, the main driver was actually that Classic ASP had been deprecated by Microsoft and was, was going to be uh, no longer supported in, in the later versions of IIS. At the same time, the company's trying to transition to more of an open source technology model, um, stop spending so much money on license costs, and et cetera, right? And then I think there was also an aspect of hiring, right? It's really hard to hire Classic ASP developers. Yeah, and, and it's just, it will be shrinking as opposed to at all growing because, as you say, like the, it going kind of bust and not, not you know, getting in new updates makes it a lot yeah. harder um and like because it's interesting with, with performance so all, all of those things you've mentioned you really have kind of been on the performance bandwagon like on that from the off you know that was like you, what you've been interested in i'm just wondering like how, how you got into that what, what drew you to the application performance it's a good question I, I think it started because somebody gave me a book when i pretty early when i started wayfair a book on performance i started reading about it and something about it appealed to me i liked the idea of optimizing things i liked the idea of scaling an application and because wafer was growing so rapidly it was a very relevant problem to what was going on there we we had to make sure things were fast the, all the things i've been reading about you know what you've been doing you know th- these are like shaving milliseconds off or seconds off that you know i suppose wh- why does that matter so much yeah well i would say that there's a ton of research from a bunch of different companies showing that it really drives business outcomes so if you run an e-commerce site people buy more if the site's fast if you run a content site people read more and then they see more ads etc it makes you more money um, one of my favorite stats is actually that firefox reduced the load time of their download page by 2.2 seconds and that got them 10 million more downloads wow. a year. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, so yeah that's insane yeah so it makes a huge difference that's crazy yeah and, and do, do you do that in your day-to-day job now then so that's primarily what you do is working out performance like trying to improve like new technologies or is it working on the current existing product and trying to find wins there yeah i would say um a bit of both so attend is a pretty small company we only have 10 engineers so it's there's a lot of just kind of cranking on features and, and building the application but when there are performance problems i tend to be the one who kind of dives in and, and figures them out and um, your kind of mindset you know, because it's really interesting. Obviously, you've got a performance-driven mindset. Like, I'm wondering, how does it change? Like, do you, do you think of like a feature with performance off the uh, from the off, or do you add that in afterwards? Is an optimizations and performance characteristics like that weren't done once the problem is solved, or is it part of the actual development process for you? Yeah, it's a good question. I think there's that famous quote, right? Premature optimization is the root of all evil. And I think there's there's a balance between thinking about the performance implications of a new project and and not going overboard with that, right? Um, so I think it's a combination of both understanding the workload you're going to be creating and then also having enough monitoring in place so if there are problems, you can resolve them very quickly. And then part of part of that, if you have iTraffic site, is rolling things out slowly. So at Etsy, we did that with these things called feature flags and we turned things on for 1% of traffic or 2% of traffic. And you can see very quickly if there's a performance problem before it torpedoes your entire web server pool. Yeah, that because I've I read about that. That must have been really interesting using that. as It's a very interesting tool because not only does it help you see if a feature works for the actual client base, as opposed it also helps for performance, as you're saying, because you can deal with the fact, okay, well, this is this is really unperforming. You know, there's something going wrong with this new, you know, new implementation that we're added. 
Yeah, that actually happened a fair amount where people would um, release a new feature, they'd ramp it up to 1%. You'd see a little spike in the graph, but not a huge spike because, again, it's only 1%. But if you see like a 10 millisecond jump in the graph at 1%, you know you're going to have a problem percent and did it i suppose using these things like these feature kind of driven approach did it allow you to feel more uh confident when you were releasing things into production because you knew that you weren't going to have to it wasn't for everyone like if you said you say you would do that the one percent so if something was a little unperformant you'd get that little spike where it may be hurt affecting one percent but it wasn't a be on end all so you, you, you know the testing and performance wise beforehand but actually releasing that stuff it kind of the barrier to entry was lowered yeah, absolutely. And so the way it typically went is it'd be on for staff only, and then you do it for 1% and then kind of ramp up from there. Um, so most serious problems were caught by internal folks. And then, yeah, the 1% thing, it, it means you don't have to spend as much time optimizing on the front end. You can just sort of see if there's a problem before it affects too many people and then fix it, which does actually save a lot of developer time because you're only targeting real performance problems. That's it, the real problems. Yeah, your uh, new Pluralsight course that was just released, uh, High Performance PHP, um, it touches on some really interesting areas, kind of through that the whole stack. So I just I'm wondering if you don't mind for the audience maybe explaining kind of why, why you went about doing that, you know, making this course and kind of who it's catered for and things like that. Absolutely, yeah. So <clears throat> I, I made the course because I've given some talks in the past, some with the same title, High Performance PHP, They've always been well-received at conferences. I think it's a really important topic, as I mentioned. And it felt like a really good way to sort of synthesize a lot of the pieces of the stack together and, and make a holistic course that can give you kind of a soup-to-nuts idea of how to optimize an application um, in, a, in a pretty short period of time. So the course is only about an hour and 45 minutes long. And yeah, I tried to see all parts of the stack and, and make it applicable to really anybody who's using a PHP application. And even if you're not using PHP, there's some pieces there about the database optimization, about load testing, um, and about web server configuration that are relevant for other stacks as well. Yeah, because I was thinking, because the only bit that obviously does touch then the PHP is just the code optimizations parts, because the web stack and the database, they're very quite generic and, and applicable to any stack that you're using. So you can get yeah. a lot of wins out of it. If you know, Even if you don't use PHP solely in your job, you know, you're going to get wins out of this from diff- some of the different modules. Yeah, totally. And that's the other piece, right? You can just, if you want to go watch part of the course, just go watch one module, right? If you just want to watch the database module, um, like you said, that's relevant no matter what code language you're using, as long as you happen to be using MySQL or even you know Postgres and SQL Server, a lot of the tips there will translate pretty well to other relational databases. So with then code optimizations, you know, you you, you mentioned Donald Knuth, you know, pre-optimization is the root of all evil. And, and I suppose that for me has been baked into my mind so much. I, I, I kind of went through, you know, the using micro optimizations and being a bit of a, you know, everyone loves, all developers secretly love, I think, these little wins and being clever and showing off, look, oh, look at this little, you know, code ninjury you can do. Um, but I suppose, you know, what, what is a micro optimization and, and how much value do you put into them? Do you, do you feel that they are worthwhile? It really depends. So I think, just to define them real quick, when I think of micro optimization, I think of a code level change. So that might be using is set versus empty, or single quotes versus double quotes, or some other sort of um, PHP level changes you might you might do. And as far as the value, I think, at a, as a blanket statement, the values are very, very low. They almost never have an impact. Um, with the caveat that if you're using monitoring and you're finding problems and you're using a profile like, like XHProf, which we might talk about later, um, and you find issues, you can get wins from them, but you really have to approach it from the point of view of, I'm only going to look at these when I know there's something that's slow, as opposed to, I'm going to spend all my time you know, trying to pick the optimal PHP built-in function or whatever the case may be, because that stuff tends to not matter. So that, and it's the whole stack, isn't it? You're looking at only one part of the story. And I think as developers, especially programmers, we, we look at just the code as being the be-all and end-all, but actually it's the whole stack down from the network layer, the request coming in, throughout all of the process life cycle web server database hits and things like that back out to the client so yeah uh, look at these code optimizations we do feel like oh this is you know a win as you say like using is set empties and things and, and it was an interesting like in a couple of your talks you, you had like phpbench.com and i never noticed it before it's really interesting like i mean again this is the programmer in me going oh this is so nerdly good and you know <laughs> it will compare you know all the different ways and there's like s- small little wins and stuff but one thing that actually like clean coding and things like that from Uncle Bob kind of taught me was writing readable code. And um, sometimes, and I have found in my own, you know, in my own kind of work is that 
the balance between readable code and performant code. Sometimes code can be very readable to the developer, but maybe less performant. Um, but it, it, but the, obviously the win there is that the developer can pick it up and understand it, you know, easily, um, as opposed to highly optimized code. I mean, this is goes into the whole like kind of low level, you know, every, you could write everything in assembly and it'd be a hell of a lot quicker than writing it in a higher level language. Um, I'm just wondering, you know, like for you, how do you balance those things? Where do you go? You know, do you start off, you know, from like the higher, you know, looking at making it readable and then you slowly find little hot spots that you know you may need to rewrite or do you just go into it and say no i'm going to be performant from the off yeah i would say that again it's sort of unsatisfying answer if it depends but almost always you want to optimize for readability because like i said it it's almost especially with php 7 and how much faster it is you're rarely going to find a problem where there's a php code-based slowdown right it might be talking to some external service or talking to the database but php running itself it runs extremely quickly and what you really want to do is avoid trying to, again, prematurely optimize, um, really think about readability, uh, maintainability, you know, making it easy to understand for your fellow developers. And then, like we said, if, if you find something that's slow, you can go in and, and dive in at that point. And I suppose that it's just using all the tools and things, you know, at your disposable once it's in production or once it's, you know, you've created it and you can see where the, the actual problems really are happening. Because, I, again, like, I mean, if there was a fundamental problem with something that PHP was doing, um, you know, that would affect a lot of people. And then it could be, you know, fixed as opposed to you having to write your high level code on top of what, you know, what PHP is doing already. Yeah, I mean, this is like one of the things I say in my course is like the number one thing you can do to speed up your PHP is get in the latest version because, <laughs> <laughs> you know, if you're on 5.3 or 5.4 or even 5.6, um, going to PHP 7 is going to have a huge impact and much more of an impact than you can do by micro optimizations or optimizing your code. I mean, and, and this is it, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm guessing at your work now, your stack is PHP 7 and you must be getting wins out of that. Yeah, I, I so attend is a mix right now of PHP and Rails. Um, but yeah, I think there's, there's a huge amount of benefit in upgrading to PHP 7. And I know it's like still hasn't been out that long, but it's at the point where it's, it's pretty stable and it's, it's worth upgrading. It's had a couple of dot releases, haven't it? It hasn't it to be able yeah, to, you know, so. kind of iron out some, yeah, some of the bugs. Mm-hmm. Um, there was one actually really interesting, um, use case kind of kind of a micro optimization i just wanted to run it by you and you know and like see what your opinion was on it because i know that you mentioned it like it was the storing the count of an array when you're looping so you would store the count and then you do your for loop but every time obviously it does its check it will do it will use the count that's within the stored variable Mm-hmm. the value as opposed um and, and that always seemed to find new you know good wins so d- would you recommend doing that is that something that you you agree on that's kind of the one thing that i say to people if you want to have an optimization in your back pocket that you do by default that's a good one to have um basically just memoize the end condition of a loop in a variable before the loop starts um otherwise php the interpreter is going to check that count and calculate that count every loop iteration so this is the kind of thing where if you're looping over 10 items or 15 items it's not going to matter at all but if you have to be looping over a very large result set or um, you know thousands of items, you may actually see a see a benefit there. So it's something that should be done in sort of tight loops or hot loops or big loops. But it's it's fine to do all the time, and it doesn't really hamper readability, right? It, it's pretty clear. Um, so that's that's like kind of the one thing because it has such a big impact that you can apply across the board. And it's also relevant to say that that also impacts JavaScript. Yeah, so, I was going to mention that actually. That's one thing I was learnt, you know, in PHP, uh, sorry, in JavaScript, the good parts it was to do that. Yeah, exactly. Brilliant. And, and so suppose the reason why is that it can, you know, you're you're essentially giving the showing the characteristics that no, this this um you know array will not change count. This will not change length. Mm-hmm. As opposed to PHP, it doesn't know what you're doing in that loop. It can't, you know, predict what's going to happen. So it's going to have to then check again each time. Exactly, right? Because you could hypothetically be mutating the array inside the loop. Um, so most compiled languages will be able to figure out that you're not doing that and sort of optimize that away. But in an interpreted languages uh, like PHP or JavaScript, they can't do that. So uh, it's better off for you to just set that for them and, and help the language figure it out. How, I mean, uh, also with PHP 7, actually, like, have you looked into HHVM? And um, have you used that in production or, you know, because obviously, you're, again, performance, you know, enthusiastic, that that must be something that's hot on your radar. Yeah, definitely. So when I was at Etsy, they actually were converting the web pool, or sorry, the, the um, API pool from PHP to HHVM. And this was actually before PHP 7 came out. So at the time, they were getting some huge wins out of going to HHVM. And now I've talked to some friends there, and <clears throat> there's a big debate raging about HHVM versus PHP 7. And, uh, you know, I think there's there's arguments on both sides. They're both excellent runtimes, and you're going to be happy going to either one from a 5.x uh, branch of PHP. So I think, you know, staying on PHP core has some nice benefits depending on how many developers you have and, and how well you are to kind of get deep in the weeds with HHVM. 
Um, some people would just prefer to be on PHP core. And the reality is that PHP 7's performance is so good that it really does start to approach the performance of, of HHVM. Yeah, I mean, off the top of your head, do you know like how comparable now? Is HHVM still a winner uh, You know, in ge- general use cases compared to PHP 7, or are they pretty much rivals now? So the last benchmarks I've seen have shown... HHVM winning on some and PHP 7 winning on some, depending on the workload. Now, one thing that's important to keep in mind is HHVM improves at a much faster rate than PHP 7 because PHP 7 is out, and until we get 7.1 or 7.2, whatever the case may be, um, we're probably not going to see another big performance improvement. But I think HHVM is on something like six-week release cycles, so you may see it start to yeah, you may see it start to speed up. And also, you think about like Facebook, who makes HHVM. They have like a huge amount of dollars tied to every improvement in HHVM. Yeah, they're so they vested like, interest in making sure that the platform is as quick as possible. Yeah, totally. I mean, there's, they, they can save hundreds of thousands of dollars on server cost if they can get a 1% improvement in HHVM. So um, I think it will continue to improve. It may outpace PHP 7 in the coming months. But again, you know, for most workloads, for most applications, PHP 7 is going to be fast enough for your purposes. Brilliant. And, and, with, and with that then, so you, you work out these performance, you know, these kind of hotspots and areas that you need to look into. One of the tools you recommend is the uh, XHProf. And I'm just wondering, would you mind explaining, you know, what that is and how it helps in regards to PHP performance? Yeah, so that was another tool that Facebook wrote. This was back, I think, before they were on HHVM. Um, and it's essentially a profiler. So it's a PHP extension you install, and it hooks into the PHP runtime, and it actually profiles every single method call and function call um, throughout your application. So you can turn it on and off on a per-request basis, but when you look at a trace, you get to see exactly what's happening uh, and exactly how long it's taking. So I find that uh, to be a very useful tool when you find a request that's slow to really dive in and figure out exactly why it's slow. Yeah, that must, I, I, that must be interesting. I'm sure in the course you, you must go into all the different areas and stuff using this tool because it has got some really interesting, you know, being able to dive in to work out function calls and things like that. So, I mean, it's definitely a win. Um, and, and do you find that, I mean, obviously you would run this only in development, but do you have to bear into take into consideration that the fact that you're actually loading up this is a performance bottleneck in itself as well? Like, <laughs> if that makes any yeah. sense, like it's a bit of a weird one. Where you're looking at performance so much, you may feel like, actually, no, this is actually making, obviously, a little less performant because it's doing this work. Yeah, definitely. So the, there is some overhead to stage prof, and which is why you typically don't see it run in production. Um, at Etsy, we did run it in production once in a while for like one-off requests, or if you wanted to do an on-demand request where you turn it on. Um, but yeah, it's it has some overhead. You can mitigate that to a certain extent by disabling the CPU profiler um, or the memory profiler. If you don't care about sort of the the CPU your app's using or the memory your app's using for a specific run, you can just look at the timing, and then the overhead will will, will be reduced. Um, so yeah, that's like one way, but it's certainly true that you would not want to profile every request in production. Uh, that will definitely slow down your application. <laughs> um, so what profiling do you do then? Like in, in a day-to-day basis, if you're not going to use something like XHProf, what would you actually employ like in a production environment? Because obviously development environments, I mean, and that's another thing actually, like with a development environment and a production, trying to keep them in sync so you actually see real world, what is this going to be like in production, you know, on your development machine. Obviously with development builds and things like that, it can be a little slower you know, from the off. I'm just wondering, do, do, how do you do that? Do you mimic them? Do you have a staging area where you're doing these performance things and then you go into the real world or do you have a lot of performance like metrics and monitors in production that help feed back what you need to fix? Yeah, it's a good question. So a bit of both. I think it's really important to have good monitoring in production. And most of that, what you'll see is what they call APM, application performance monitoring. And that's typically like a new relic or an app Neta or something like that where you have, again, it's like a little agent that's sitting on the box and profiling the app. But those vendors work very hard to make sure their overhead is more like 1% or 2%. So low enough that you can run it in production, you can profile every single request, um, and you're not going to get a big a big problem there. And then you look, can look at their dashboards, and you can see which requests are slow. And then when you find a slow request, that's when you pull out XHProf or some other tool set similar to dig into the request and see why it's slow. Try and replay it, and then, yeah, that's it. So you get in your development box then with all these tools, you know, these instruments in place, and it allows you then to find, you know, find the tune and hunt down all those issues. Yeah, and you're asked about staging as well. That's certainly something that we'll also do where you have a staging environment that is very, very close to production uh, with all the production data, et cetera, and then you can do some testing in there to make sure you're not going to really torpedo performance. And uh, with, with code optimization, so you've got the micro optimizations and another one people think of, you know, and it, I suppose actually it was the memorization of the count variable, which, you know, we were speaking about with that optimization with the for loop was caching. 
Um, mm. And it's one of those things where caching is a hard topic. Uh, the famous quote, you know, is two hard things. There's two hard things in computer science, cache invalidation, naming things and off by one errors. I always <laughs> find that hilarious. Um, but <laughs> cache invalidation is hard. I mean, caching in general is hard. I, I think, do, do you go over that in, in your course? Are you, are you a big proponent of caching as a thing to do? Or do you take it very, you know, do, do you think of it very much like that we only use caching as a last resort? I do talk about it a bit in the course. I, I actually am a big fan of caching in, in most cases. Um, you have to be a bit careful about when you cache and how you cache. But in general, yeah, I mean, typically the database is the slowest part of your application. And if you can cache some of those queries and offload them, uh, you're going to see some, some big benefits. And it's really a question of sort of at what layer you're caching and then what your expiry times are. And then to your point, how do you invalidate those, those values? Um, and that can add quite a bit of complexity. So you have to be a bit careful about it. And, and with your caching, you know, in your experience with it, like what pro, what have you been using? You use Memcache, Redis, things like that, or even just a pre-computed, you know, like maybe using MySQL's query cache. What 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 kind of caching do you do you propose and use? Yeah, so typically uh, you'll see Memcache a lot. Late, more lately, you'll see you'll see Redis in place of Memcache. You can kind of make Redis a drop-in replacement for Memcache, and the benefits you get from that are number one, persistence. You can actually have Redis write to disk, so if you reboot the box, you can still have your cache stay around. Um, and then Redis also provides some extra data types uh, for storing the the cache values. So Redis and Memcache are kind of your most common options there. The MySQL query cache can be a bit dangerous because if you have a write-heavy workload, the query cache is not very good at dealing with that. Uh, and you can get actually even more slowdown than you would without even having the cache because the act of maintaining the cache has enough overhead. That trying to, yeah, trying to maintain a cache, yeah, which you never yeah. actually get to use because it's invalidating the second you've done. Um, and there's a pattern actually, the, which is very common and it's one that I've been, you know, have used plenty of times. I'm sure everyone's known and used it, but they probably don't know the actual name, the, the cache aside pattern. I'm just wondering if you wouldn't mind explaining that. Yeah, so this is probably the most common caching pattern people will see and have used in the past. It's basically just you read from the cache, if the value is there, great. If it's not, go get the value from the data store and then store that in the cache. Um, so that's the typical cache aside pattern. And it's the easiest to implement because you basically just say, hey, Memcache, do you have this? Oh, no, okay. Hey, MySQL, do you have this? Oh, great, you do. So then I'll put it in the cache. Um, so that's that's the cache aside pattern. And and yeah, it's, it's super easy to implement. And like you said, there's this issue of having a cold cache and then having to warm it up. The nice thing about the cache aside pattern is you can have some other worker box or some other process that's populating values in the cache. Uh, and then your web servers can just read from the cache and sort of always have it be warm. So you can do some pre-warming steps and it'll transparently work for the application. And does that kind of, I suppose that makes deployment more technical and a bit more advanced because you have to then prepare, you know, heat up the cache first and everything like that before you can actually deploy a certain, and it, I suppose it's also like, I know that Etsy, there was, there's the whole, the way that you actually do the atomic deployments with switching, um, you know, it's essentially like sim linking, switching deploys and things like that and invalidating the cache of a previous version whilst maintaining a cache of the new version. Yeah, <clears throat> it's, a, it's a good point. So, the other benefit of the cache aside pattern is you can have memcache live on different machines than your PHP boxes. And so on, for most deploys, you don't need to invalidate the cache. You can just continue to use the cache that's already there. Uh, the challenge comes when you want to change the signature of the cache or if you change something that requires you to invalidate the cache, in which case you may put a version number in the cache key, um, which will effectively blow the cache all at once. Uh, or, or you can do something else like pre-warm the cache and, and clear out the old values sort of in a, in a stage process. And it really depends on, on how that's going to work. This is something that actually did happen a lot at Etsy. We had a cache for, um, essentially for search, like if you search on Etsy, the listings that you see, um, a lot of that data was cached. And if they made a change on the search backend and had to invalidate the cache, you'd see load time spike temporarily and then slowly come back down to the baseline as the cache filled up. And, and, and actually developing them with these caches, because because obviously then you're reliant on the cache. Um, do, do, within your development environments, do you actually employ the cache as well? And, you know, you develop with a cache in mind or do you think of it as just, no, I'm doing this process and a cache is just an aid on top, you know, an additional layer as opposed to being part of the actual implementation? Yeah, I'm a big proponent of having your dev environments be as close as possible to production. So I do think it's worth having a cache uh, in place in, in development. Now, that might mean that you just have Memcache running on your VM or whatever it is, and it's it's not like a separate server, but at least mimicking those those calls, and it's still a network request, even if it's over the local network, uh, it's still sort of exercising that path and making sure your code is actually going to work in production. 
Awesome. Uh, so, so we've now got you know the code optimizations you know in place, and and then there's kind of going away from that, you know, kind of going outwards. You know, you would have the web server. Well, there's obviously two big ones are Nginx and Apache, um, and and you kind of propose Nginx. You know, you're a bit more adv- you know advantages of using Nginx. I'm just wondering like what you feel what what you feel Nginx brings to the table that Apache doesn't, or are they both kind of you know good a, a similar again where you know they they both do the same job. But, you know, one maybe does it a little better. Yeah, so this is a, another hot debate in the community, right? But I think that one thing that's important to note is, so there's, there's sort of old school Apache and new school Apache. Old school Apache is typically Apache 2.2 and using NPM pre-fork. New school is Apache 2.4 with NPM event. And that's an event-driven process model in Apache. And that makes Apache 2.4 behave a lot more like Nginx in terms of performance. So uh, there's not going to be a huge, huge difference between Nginx and Apache if you're on Apache 2.4 and using NPM event. But the important thing to point out there is that Nginx typically works a little better with static content. Uh, and I actually like Nginx because it's a little easier to configure from my point of view. But, you know... Etsy ran Apache, uh, had no problems with it, because the takeaway here is that if you have a PHP request, let's say it's going to take something like 100 to 200 milliseconds, the time you're spending in your web server might only be 2 or 3 or 5 milliseconds. So no matter how fast your web server is, you're still gated by the rest of the request. So the difference in performance from Nginx and Apache on a PHP application is pretty much negligible. Yeah, there is no real wins, I suppose. It is, a, it is a, a, your preference, you know, and maybe configuration options and extensions you can have and things like that. And like, I mean, the static content, you know, on Nginx is a win. Uh, is there a reach? Do you know the re- technical reasons why, uh, you know, Nginx is better uh, than Apache at static content? Yeah, well, so that's, that really comes down to the fact that for a static file, say a CSS file or a JavaScript file, the vast majority of the request is actually spent in the web server, because all you're doing is reading the file off disk or potentially reading out of memory or whatever it is. Um, so the majority of the request is actually happening in the in the web server. So if if Apache takes four milliseconds to serve that that static JS file, but Nginx only takes two milliseconds to serve that file, that two millisecond difference makes a big difference when yeah. the total request is only four milliseconds. But again, if it's a PHP request and it's taking 150 milliseconds, that two millisecond difference doesn't matter. Uh, and you know, back in the day of Apache, you know, there was mod PHP. And, you know, one of the wins of, a, of PHP, you know, back in the day was that you could load up Apache and really you get PHP included out of the box. You know, it would load up with PHP. You could even mod PHP. Um, and then, you know, performance wise and things and, and Nginx, you can't you don't get those luxuries. You, you actually have to go down this route of using a process manager. Um, mm-hmm. And I'm just wondering, could you mind like explaining what actually a process manager is and like what, what are the performance gains for using one? Because it's almost like adding an extra layer to the stack. It is, exactly. And so really the difference is that with the process manager, you have a, a thing that's running your PHP processes separately from your web server processes. And it essentially gives you more flexibility. So one of the things you can do there is you can have a bunch of web servers running PHP FPM, which is the process manager that most people use for PHP. And then you don't even need to run Nginx on those boxes. You can run Nginx on some load balancer or on some server that fronts all of those web servers and then only have one Nginx machine or two and then have a ton of web servers behind them just running PHP FBM. So it allows you to kind of separate out that web server layer from the uh, the PHP layer and scale them independently. That's awesome. Uh, and so so with that, you know, adding the process manager in, you know, I suppose, you know, that, that you know, people who are from other languages such as Ruby uh, and, you know, Python, they, they're used to this, you know, they're having to have this extra layer um, already. Um, yeah. and, and so with the process, you know, you have like child process and configuration like that, that becomes a big thing because you have these options, you know, being able to like, how many am I able to spin up, you know, concurrently and how many I'm meant to minimally have, you know, or maximum, you know, I'm just wondering like how, how you go about working out these configurations and tweaking it. Is it a very, you know, uh, product specific uh, configuration or is there kind of a, a silver bullet? Well, there's never a silver bullet, but is there a good <laughs> option, you know, for, you know, usual use cases? Yeah, so I think that with PHP FPM, uh, the max children you set is extremely important, right? Because it really determines how many processes PHP can be running simultaneously. And that will dramatically limit your throughput. If you only allow five to run at a time, you can only serve five concurrent requests. And that might not be enough. Um, typically, the governing factor for child processes in the PHP world is memory. So every process needs to have a certain amount of memory, and depending on how big your box is, that's going to determine how many child processes you can run. And the formula that I like to use, you take the maximum memory on the server, you subtract about 500 megabytes, that's to account for the operating system that's running on the machine, and then you divide by 20 megabytes to get the number of children processes that you should run. Now, that 20 megabyte number, that's going to depend on your application, because if you have a really heavy app, each process might actually need more memory, 
and you might want to be a little bit careful there. So you don't, you definitely don't want to set that too high because then you'll run out of memory and performance will grind to a halt. Uh, so leave yourself some headroom, but that's kind of a good rule of thumb to, to start with. And then you can kind of see your performance and see how it goes and maybe run some load tests and, and see what's, what's happening. That's really interesting. So, uh, and then with these child processes, keeping them around. So, I suppose one of the because with with the you know the mod PHP days, it was essentially you know you you uh, you'd load up the environment, the PHP environment, do your work with that request, and then tear it back down just for another request to come in. You know, maybe it, it already waiting. You know, for another, you know for it to actually work again. Um, with with you know FPM and things like that, you, you, is it so you're able now to actually um, you know maintain persist these child processes or maintain them for a little while longer and actually reuse them? Yeah, you can. So that's that's typically how it's going to work. Is those child processes will stick around um, until you restart them, and you can you can actually configure with PHP FBM how many requests you want them to serve before you kill them. And I think it is a good idea to to set a same value there, maybe a thousand requests or two thousand requests. And really, what that does is prevent memory leaks. If you have some sort of memory leak in your PHP application, uh, you don't want that process sticking around for too too long, or else it might start to absorb more and more memory. And if you just set a, a limit on it, uh, like say a thousand. Every thousand requests, it'll just gracefully kill that process and start up another one um, with no with no downtime and no risk. It'll let the request finish on the first process uh, and then kill it and then start start new ones. So, so with this chart, does this actually make it harder to actually log errors and things like that? Like you're now you've almost got loads of different processes running, and you, when you're deploying something, you don't know if you're running. You know, eventually they all go to the same version, but you may have a case where you're actually running a process which is using an old version of something, whereas opposed to it's, you know, then starting up a new child process with the new version. Um, how do you go about things like that? Yeah, it's an interesting question. So it's usually not a huge problem. It can be an issue with deploys if you don't have an atomic deploy uh, system set up. And if you have sort of multiple processes running two different versions of the code at the same time, um, you can sometimes have issues with that. But typically it's a very short term thing. And then you asked about logging. The other, this is sort of like one of the lesser known variables that when it comes to PHP FPM configuration, but there is a, a variable called catch worker output, and uh, you really want to set that to true. And what that means is all the child workers of PHP FPM, you'll catch their output and then log it to the right log file that's configured in, in PHP FPM. So um, that's a good way to make sure that all of your children are logging to the right place and you, and you get all the data from those child processes. Oh, nice. That's, yeah, that's really interesting. <laughs> Never knew that. Um, <laughs> and then, so on top of that layer, um, you know, so you've got the web server, and actually in front of that, you may even have, I mean, typically, actually you can consider Nginx one of these, but a reverse proxy. Um, mm-hmm. And one that's very popular is Varnish. Um, mm-hmm. And it, that significantly helps speed up applications uh, using things like edge side includes and things. And so I'm just wondering, like, have you employed those, have you needed to employ those, you know, in your performance to, to gain performance? Or have you been able to just live without them? Yeah, so I haven't personally used Varnish, but what I've used is the Akamai tool that does full page caching. So it's, it's very similar. They have basically a, a, they may even be using Varnish in the back end. I'm not sure, but it's, it's the same idea where you're caching full HTML pages, um, at the edge to speed things up. And so what I'll, what I'll say about that is that it does make things dramatically faster because you're just essentially serving a static page. Um, but this comes back to the whole cache and validation is hard thing. And, uh, <laughs> And we ended up turning it off at Wayfair because it was it was just really hard to invalidate, and people were seeing stale pages, and uh, it became more of a maintenance burden than the performance gain we were getting. So this is going to kind of depend on what kind of site you're running, how often your content changes. If you have pages that are pretty much static, and you know you don't change them that often, then that can be a good fit. But you do have to be careful with with needing to invalidate stuff on a regular basis and, and running into that whole disaster. Yeah, because I suppose that's then adding even more complexity. And again, in your development environment, you'd probably want to include this as well, specifically if you're using something like edge side includes that may be required. Um, I know that a lot of you know frameworks such as Symfony, they cater for that and you know, are very good at dealing with those. Yeah, so that's, that's a good point, right? So the edge side includes do get around some of that cache invalidation piece because you might include the dynamic portion or include the static portion and then um, the rest of it can be served by PHP. So that can that can help quite a bit. But it does add complexity, and you just have to make sure that it's worth the complexity. That's it, yeah. <laughs> That's it. I mean, this is—it's all trade-offs, isn't it? I suppose you know, even from the low-level code, you know, to these, you know, high-level adding a varnish or adding, you know, maybe you know, configuring and you know, spending a lot of time working out what FPM settings and stuff. It's a trade-off of what's going to work for your application at that time and the load you actually have. Um, yeah, right. and then that's where you obviously get those APMs. You know, you, you work out what what the monitoring is, what you actually need. Uh, you know, from your actual real use cases. Yeah, yeah, and I will say that the other benefit of um, 
of full page caching is if you have global customers and you have one data center that happens to be, you know, let's say it's in the, on the East Coast of the US and you have customers in Australia, um, they're going to have a long trip to getting your content. So if you can cache stuff at the edge, it, it may make a huge difference for them. But again, it comes down to that invalidation piece and, and how much of that you're willing to take on. And I suppose, you know, obviously, you know, not thinking actually at the request level, you know, for our, from the web server, but, you know, having these external caches, CDNs and things like that is obviously a win in this kind of case with, you know, CSS files and stuff. Oh, yeah, especially for static content, a CDN is kind of a, a no brainer if your customers are distributed at all. Do you uh, have you actually run the system where, you know, you'd have your Nginx install, your web server install and your FPMs installs on a separate box or do you typically meld them together? But it's just a nice option that you could have. Yeah, I haven't personally done it. I've always run Nginx on the same machine because Nginx is pretty lightweight. Um, but if you if you happen to have like a giant server pool and and you might save some some memory by doing that uh, by splitting them apart, that's definitely an option. But I I typically just run Nginx and PHP FPM on the same box because it's it's not that much overhead. And then the other level a layer, and I suppose the most interesting layer, my my in kind of the way I like to think is the database layer. Um, you know because. Obviously, all our data, well, most of our data, you know, from a request, well, you know, a PHP request, you know, script will come along and it will actually request, you know, data from the database. And your data store is a very important part of that, you know, to be and performance within that. Uh, so I'm just wondering, like, you know, you, you speak because in the course you do a lot of the MySQL stuff, I think. So just wondering, like, what your history of MySQL is. And I noticed that it, in the past you'd use Postgres. Uh, yep. I'm just wondering, do you have like a preferred database for, for performance reasons or is it just, you know, what you're working up with at that time? Yeah, so the main reason why I focused on MySQL is because I think it's still the most popular relational database that you see out there. I think Postgres is becoming more uh, well-known and more popular, but I think for most PHP applications, you, you'll often see MySQL. Um, from a performance perspective, you know, MySQL, Postgres, and SQL Server can all be tuned to the point where you're going to have, have good performance. Although I will say that the forks of MySQL are, are a good thing to look at uh, if, you're, if you really care about performance and you want to use something that looks like MySQL. That's really interesting because, you know, obviously the whole story behind MySQL now being owned by Oracle and, and all these forks. So, so uh, would you actually recommend then using a fork over the community edition available? Like, is, there before, is there actually out-of-the-box performance advantages of doing that? Yeah, there are. So the, the most popular one and the most sort of well-known one is probably Percona. And Percona is a, is a company and they're a services company and they spent a lot of time making a MySQL fork called Percona Server. Um, and they, they claim that performance is substantially better. I, I think that's... That's probably true. I mean, it really depends, again, on your workload. But um, it is a drop-in replacement, and there's there's really no extra work besides just installing it. So I think that's probably a worthwhile uh, thing to at least investigate if you are planning on using a MySQL flavor of some sort. And then obviously looking at um, like logging, like ha- you know, getting working out if you actually do get performance but, uh, benefits from it, is that done through then like the slow query logs in MySQL and then looking through your AMPs and, and actually looking through the requests, you know, using something like XHProf? Yeah, well, so one of the, one of the nice things about Percona is they also add a ton of really nice tools and diagnostic tools for MySQL. Um, the downside is the tools only exist in Percona, so it's kind of hard to compare <laughs> Percona and MySQL. But if you look, I'll actually put this in the show notes, but there's a great link that kind of compares Percona server against MySQL community edition. And there's things like per index performance counters, per user performance counters, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a ton of data you can get from Percona to see how things are performing. Um, and you also mentioned the slow query log. I find the slow query log to be an extremely useful tool, both on community edition and Percona and other forks. Uh, I think it's an indispensable tool to find out if you have, have slow queries going on. That's brilliant. And, and one of the other then topics you actually talk about with the database, and this is an interesting one for me, is the data denormalization. You know, in university and like in pretty much in our, you know, our relational database mind, you know, we're always taught to be relational, be, you know, denormalize everything, you mm-hmm. know, and make it so, you know, you know, it's, it's got a single source of truth for every bit of data. Um, you know, data denormalization is almost like do it where it is doing the reverse of that. Uh, for performance reasons and you know using obviously in a relational database manner you know or you can go in and use you know in quotes no sequel kind of things like document data stores and things and i'm just wondering like how how have you gone about with data denormalization is that something that you uh, you know you would kind of seriously consider other alternatives maybe caching first before you go down that route or is it a good thing to do you know as an off like okay this is getting hit a lot this query with a lot of joins because i noticed that you know in one of your uh, presentations you said like oh we don't hardly have any joins obviously joins are a you know a performance you know thing so denormalizing everything is it a really good win for you so it's a it's a good question i think it does depend on your app i hate being always the guys like it depends but unfortunately with performance i think it (laughs) i think it turns out it is very platform and and your application specific yeah i I will say that 
you can get some some big benefits out of denormalizing data, but uh, it does add complexity and does make it a little bit harder to to make sure your data integrity is maintained. Um, so I think caching is a great sort of low impact way to to speed things up without sort of worrying about the complexity of denormalization because caching is pretty simple to implement and pretty low risk, especially if you're not. Uh, if you're not looking at data that needs to change all the time, so I would I would start with caching before denormalizing. Uh, but but there are times where you know it makes sense, and especially you'll see it very often in like a reporting database where you might have some extract transform load process where you take the data out of your uh, out of your main database, your production database, and then transform it somehow and denormalize it for reporting purposes because otherwise reporting can be extremely slow when you're trying to report on large amounts of data. So that's a great use case for denormalization because it's kind of a one way denormalization. And it's just a reporting database, so if it gets out of sync, you can always just fix it. Um, but that's that's kind of the the place you'll typically see people start with denormalizing. Yeah, because I can imagine that, you know for me it's the invariant of, of trying to keep you know make sure this data again it's the caching validation of working out and keeping it out up to date. Um, yeah. Just, you know, how do you go around that? Is it like triggers and things like that to make sure the data is you know available, or do you just do it? You know, I suppose in a reporting sense, it's a dump, isn't it? So it's essentially right once here it is. This is you know they're trying to maintain these denormalizations adds an right. extra level. <laughs> right. So sometimes frameworks will help you do it um, by default. Like you can set up relationships with a, with an active record or something and it can help you maintain those, those uh, relationships. And then like you said, for reporting, it's typically just a one-time dump. I, I'm not a big fan of triggers. I think triggers, uh, they're a little bit opaque. They're hard they, they do have performance implications. Um, they're, they're hard to maintain. It's just sort of like magic that's happening in the database. So I tend to avoid using triggers to maintain that data and typically try to do it in the application level. You know, a lot of people would say, um, you know, application, you know, it's, optimizations are on top of an application, whereas, you know, they shouldn't be the, be, you know, baked in. But are you of the opinion then that, you know, you should be seeing all these optimizations? Obviously, you said, you know, you should be seeing that you're doing caching. And, you know, again, with like database denormalizations, these shouldn't be opaque. You know, it's a data store issue. You know, it's the fact that it's the triggers, should, you know, the database store should be maintaining these invariants. It's actually the application itself that should be instead. Yeah, well, so here's, here's my attitude about that. I think it's way easier to scale the application tier. You just make more web servers and, and add them behind the load balancer than it is to scale the database tier. So you basically want to keep as much business logic, as much uh, complexity out of your data layer as possible because it's just way, way harder to scale. Um, and, and I've seen that borne out at, at both Wayfair and Etsy where the less you do in the database, the better. Um, <laughs> and, and, you know, because you can always buy more, more web servers and they're, they're pretty cheap. From your experience, then, like your the actual database layer, like actually, you know, getting uh, parent, you know, master, slave, parent, you know, child kind of process running there, and uh, have you have you kind of had that experience, or have you always been a single data store? Yeah, so I've absolutely done done that. I think the the easiest sort of first step is to make a read replica, and it just literally just gets replicated to you from your production read write server, and then you can have certain queries that only hit the read replica. So one of the one of the big benefits that you can do there, um, most frameworks will let you do this. You basically call different methods for reads and writes, and then you can just set up a different database connection for reads and writes. And you can have your reads always hit your read-only machine, and have your writes always hit, obviously, your, your read-write machine. Um, and that enables you to really scale those reads, because, again, most workloads for most applications tend to be read-heavy. Um, and if you're just scaling uh, a read-only replica, that's much easier to do than, than scaling a multi-write system. Yeah, like a master-master and trying to handle that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and so, because there's, a, there's a, a, you know, a very popular CQRS, commands query separation. And mm -hmm. I was wondering, like, is that something you employ then? You know, like, obviously, with this, you know, thinking of reads and writes is completely separate activities in your design of applications, do you think that way? You can. I mean, certainly, it, it makes it pretty easy to do. Like, uh, for example, Laravel, you can actually set up a, a separate database connection for reads and writes. So if you do that from the get-go, um, it really can make it easier over the long term, as opposed to trying to go through and finding in your application the places where you're doing reads that are happen to be happening a lot, and then cache those, or whatever the case may be. So I do think it makes sense to think a little bit about uh, sort of a, a default thing you can put in place just so it's easy to separate out reads and writes. And it shouldn't be that much work, right? It's it's basically just instead of calling, you know, db query, you're going to call it db read or db write. I suppose, again, it's another level layer, though. I mean, like, again, in your development stack, would, would that be something then you'd, again, employ that I need to not only have, I need to have a database read write system within my development, or would you allow the development environment not to cater for that? Well, so one thing you can do in development is, just have the read queries as a different user than the write queries and then get different permissions. Yeah. So you don't need to set up a That's second a really database. Idea. 
Yeah, no, no separate database, just have different users to, and handle it that way. That's awesome. And, and, and what tools then do you use for performance? Um, you know, because I say we're talking about, you know, like using these AMP, uh, APMs and things like that. Like within kind of, you know, your day to day, I want to test to see if this is actually helping, you know, on, you know, my development box maybe or in staging just before you know, I'm going to hit this server to make sure, you know, maybe giving it real traffic before real traffic actually hits it. H- how do you go about doing that? Yeah, my, my sort of favorite tool for that is called Siege. And Siege is a command line tool that's uh, used for load testing. And it's it's pretty easy to use. There's there's a great help for it. There's good documentation. Um, basically, you give it a concurrency level. You give it how many requests you want it to run. And then one of my favorite pieces is you can give it a text file full of URLs, and it will kind of randomly cycle through those URLs. So you can use it just to hit one URL, or you can hit a bunch. So it like simulates like real traffic then, kind of going through, working, you know, what a real-life user system would be. Yeah, exactly. I suppose from these three levels, um, what do you find from your experience, you know, is really the bottleneck? You know, well, where, is the, where do you find the most common uh, performance wins and the most problems from, from a, you know, from a, either a code perspective, using the wrong web server configuration, or maybe even the database store is, is in the wrong configuration? Yeah, so I'll say that if... With the caveat that if you have your web server configured and your database configured in the right way, most of the problems will come from the database layer. Um, that's that's the layer that, like I said, is harder to scale. That's the layer that's going to be typically the slowest because all the data is there and you have to query the data. And as the data gets larger and larger and larger, you're going to get some slowdowns. Um, that's almost always where you'll find the real performance bottlenecks. Obviously, you know, good indexing and things like that, looking through your slow query logs, explain, analyze is, is really your, you know, your best friends. Yeah, I mean, what, like, indexing is, is probably the number one thing, right? Like, if you, if you set up your slow query log and you look at your slow queries, it's almost always going to be they're running, you're running a query that is not using an index. Because uh, on, on modern hardware, if you have well-indexed tables, um, SQL is pretty fast. And do you, I mean, uh, I, I'm quite a proponent of Postgres and like it, it's got far, far, far more like fine tuned indexing features. Like, did you find that you missed that in my going to MySQL or do you mind just MySQL's kind of I just slap an index on it? It doesn't really give you like, you know, partial indexing and things like that. Yeah, I mean, I prefer Postgres as well. I think from a from a feature and functionality point of view, it's better. From like sort of a, a safety point of view, it's better. Like if you look at MySQL, by default with strict mode off, MySQL does some crazy, That's crazy scary. stuff. <laughs> I mean, at least you've got InnoDB now. I mean, yeah, we're back in yeah. my ISIM. It's like, yeah, we don't care about your data, really. Right, right, exactly. Yeah, if, if you're running MySQL with my ISIM, like you're going to have a bad time. So <laughs> don't do that. <laughs> What other database layer, uh, layer uh, kind of um, systems have you used? Have you used like any of the NoSQL stuff, Cassandra's? I mean, I know you've used Redis uh, mm-hmm. Key Value Store. Like, did you find any uh, win out of using document databases and things like that? Have you had any experience using those? I, I have. So when I was at Wayfair, they um, they started adding Mongo to the stack, and I think they're actually taking it away now. And then actually, a similar thing happened at Etsy. They added Mongo, and then they removed it. Um, I, I think the takeaway with with something like MongoDB or or other similar NoSQL data store uh, systems is that you'll often add them being like, oh, it's going to be so fast, it's going to be great. And then you get down the road a little bit and you realize, you know, I really actually want to relate data. Yep. I, I want it. to do I some joints. It's so much easier, that's it, to query, be able to actually query something. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, you know, there's certainly some performance gains you can get from there, but for almost all applications, if, if you're using a traditional relational database, it's tuned properly, it's got good indexes, you're not going to have a big problem with, uh, with performance. Well, brilliant. Thank, thank you so much for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. It's been really interesting to pick your brain about all these different things. And I highly recommend everyone, yeah, to go and check out your Pluralsight course and, and obviously your blog. I mean, did you blog a lot? I know you do a lot of talks. I was, I was listening to a couple, but you have some good uh, YouTube video, like videos posted of, of your talks. Yeah, I used to I used to blog a lot more. Now that I'm at a startup, uh, time has run short. But uh, <laughs> instead of blogging, I made the Plural Site course, so that's a that's a good thing to check out. Um, yeah, and then once in a while, I'll write a blog post as well. Brilliant. Uh, anything else you want to plug, man? No, I think uh, I'll put some stuff in the show notes to talk about some of the database stuff we talked about. Um, and yeah, I think uh, you know the PHP content on Plural Site is still a little light. But I've got that one course up there, and I'm actually working on a on a course on Composer right now oh, as well. Brilliant! So, oh, I'm so. interested in that. That'd be great. When you cut, when it gets released, let us know, and we'll uh, definitely have to do another podcast. Yeah, I will. Yeah, and I had a great time, so I really appreciate it. Brilliant! Awesome, man. Well, thank you so much again for coming on. And uh, yeah, uh, audience, we'll speak to you again next week. Goodbye. All right. Thanks. Bye. You've been listening to Three Devs and a Maybe. You can contact us at contact at three devs and a maybe dot com. Or follow us on Twitter at the number three, Devs and a Maybe.